Hi, my name is Carney Gouda, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Seppa Kuhn at the University of Illinois, and I'm jointly advised by Madhumani at Northwestern. And today I'd like to tell you about my postdoctoral work on predicting microbial community metabolic function from genomic structure. So in virtually every natural environment, microbial communities are collectively consuming nutrients and exchanging intermediates and producing products, and all this has a profound impact on the chemical state of their environment. And these impacts are not just local, they can be global as well. So microbial communities are key mediators of the global nitrogen cycle, which is critical for the functioning and persistence of all life on this planet. So understanding microbial community uh, metabolism is of clear importance. Um, we've made a lot of progress technologically towards observing microbial communities via sequencing. So. Um, we can sequence an entire community and identify taxonomically who's present in the community. We can also characterize the genomic composition, the genetic composition of that community. Um, but at this point, we have very little understanding of how any of this information relates to uh, the dynamics of that community, so the quantitative fluxes of nutrients through that community, for example. So in order to build some understanding, I'd like to pose the following prediction problem, which is, can we predict uh, community metabolic dynamics from genomes? So can we predict the quantitative fluxes of nutrients um, through a community as a function of the genomic composition of that community? So rather than starting with the soils, we wanted to um, start uh, in a simpler context in laboratory experiments. And in order to do that, we chose uh, denitrification as a model metabolic process to study. So bacteria, which do denitrification, convert uh, nitrate, which is NO3, to dinitrogen gas, which is N2. And they do this through a series of several intermediates, um, the first of which is nitrite, which is NO2. Um, so we chose denitrification as a model metabolic process um, because, for one, the genomic parts list, so to speak, of denitrification has been well characterized by um, decades of work in bacterial genetics. So we know a lot about the structural genes, um, the sensors and regulators, and the transporters that are involved and necessary for this process. Also, um, we chose this process because denitrifying bacteria are tractable, so they can be readily isolated from soils and grown aerobically in the lab. So our approach to solving this prediction problem is a statistical learning approach. Um, first, we isolate a diverse ensemble of denitrifying bacteria from soils. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to show you the results from 62 bacterial isolates that we've, we've obtained from soils. We then assemble these isolates into defined communities in the lab and assay the dynamics of nitrate and nitrite. So nitrate and nitrite are the two intermediates of denitrification that we can measure in high throughput. We then relate these dynamics observations to uh, the genomic composition of the communities via statistical learning. Okay, so after we've isolated our denitrifying bacteria from soils, we measure their metabolite dynamics in monoculture. So to give you a sense of the readout, I'm plotting a time series of nitrate and nitrite concentrations over about a 60 hour period. And initially uh, this uh, particular strain consumes um, it's initially provided nitrate um, over a course of around 16 hours, and at the same time it excretes a small amount of nitrite, which it then consumes later as well. Um, so to parameterize and make sense of these dynamics, we fit them to um, a simple consumer resource model, which resembles the Minot model for uh, microbial growth on a substrate. In this case, there are two substrates, nitrate, which is A, and nitrite, which is I. Um, and the population grows on these substrates, and um, the dynamics are characterized by four key parameters. So RA and RI are the rates of consumption of nitrate and nitrite respectively, and gamma A and gamma I are the yields on nitrate and nitrite. So for each of our 62 isolates, we can pretty well parameterize and capture their dynamics using this model and these four parameters. And this model gives us not only a way to characterize uh, the metabolic dynamics of individual strains, but it also gives us a prediction for community dynamics. Um, so 
to see this, let's take the example of a simple two-strain community. So each strain in the community has its own set of these four parameters. And we can form uh, the community metabolic prediction by summing the rate contributions of each strain to nitrate and nitrite consumption dynamics. And um, this prediction is essentially assuming that the strains are interacting in their pair culture only uh, through resource competition. So we can test this prediction um, using pair culture experiments. So here I'm showing the monoculture um, data and fits for three different strains. And I'm going to show the results of pair culture experiments of each of these three strains along with the model prediction. So each of these off diagonal terms is showing the result of uh, a pair culture experiment. And what we see is that um, in all of these three cases, the pair culture dynamics are predictable from the single strain dynamics. That is, the model gives us an accurate prediction for the community metabolic dynamics. Um, so this is something that we observe generally in our collection of strains with one sort of general exception, which I won't talk about at this point for the sake of time. So these experiments are telling us that the metabolic dynamics of simple two or even three or four strain communities um, that they can be predicted um, from measurements that we can make on individual strains. And if we think back to the original question, which was about predicting the metabolic dynamics of communities from genomic composition, um, this observation simplifies the problem somewhat. So instead of predicting uh, community metabolic dynamics from uh, genomic composition, the problem is now reduced to predicting the metabolic uh, dynamics of monocultures from genomic features, or more specifically, predicting the values of these model parameters which encode the dynamics from genomic features. Okay, so now I can be more concrete about what I mean by genomic features. So we use gene presence and absence as genomic features, and specifically, we use the presence and absence of genes which are related to denitrification. So we've chose, chosen 17 genes including um, structural elements, regulators, and transporters, all related to denitrification. So this is a relatively coarse and low-dimensional uh, representation of the genomes of these organisms, but you can see that there is a substantial amount of variability from strain to strain in these genes. So we formulate the statistical problem in the following way. We perform a linear regression of each of these model phenotypic parameters onto the presence and absence of these denitrification-related genes. So recall that one of the model parameters was this nitrate consumption rate, RA. And what we do to predict these values of RA from the genomes is to linearly regress the presence and absence of these genes, where presence is given by a 1 in this G matrix and absence is given by 0. We then use L1 regularized regression to obtain an estimate for the coefficient vector beta. So the elements of beta are telling us how much each gene contributes to the quantitative value of the thing that we're trying to predict. So to train this regression, we use around two thirds of our strains, that's about 42 strains. And um, because we're concerned about um, the model overfitting on our training set, we hold out 20 of our strains for out of sample testing. Remarkably, we find that this approach actually works. So we find that these um, parameters which encode the metabolic dynamics can actually be predicted from denitrification, gene presence, and absence. So here I'm showing the example of the nitrate consumption rate RA prediction. And the bar chart is showing the coefficient vector beta. And we find that the L1 regularized method produces a sparse model, which only needs three variables to predict uh, the nitrate consumption rate, RA. The scatter on the, the right is showing the correspondence between the observed values and the values that are predicted by this regression model um, in the training set. And we wanted to verify that this model is not um, overfitting to these training set data. So we evaluated the model on an independent set of out of sample data. And what we find is that um, the model still re retains a lot of its predictive power in this out-of-sample test set. So the correlation coefficient between these um, observed and predicted values in the test set 
indicated by these blue dots is around 0.54. Um, the same approach apply to the um, nitrate consumption rate parameter, Ri, yields also um, a sparse model with different coefficients being important now. And when we evaluate this model on the out-of-sample test set, we find that again, the model does a good job of predicting these values. So in summary, we made great progress towards demonstrating a predictive mapping between genotype and community metabolism for denitrifying bacteria. We demonstrated that the gene presence and absence of denitrification-related genes are able to predict the metabolic dynamics of individual strains. And also, we've demonstrated that simple community dynamics are predictable from individual strain information. And in future work, we're interested in, for one, understanding why the regression works. So is the regression providing us with mechanistic insight into what's going on? And also, whether we can make these sorts of predictions in more complicated situations, like in spatially structured environments, and even in natural environments like soils. Thank you.